is great. Drew Bider. Drew Hi, Bider. Greg right. Peterson. Yeah. All right. This is a thrill. Look at you. Yeah. You look so professorial and look like you're a National Teachers Hall of Fame member. This is, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever interviewed a National Teachers Hall of Fame member. And that was such an exciting night for us to watch uh, you well, getting, getting inducted because it was a culmination of a lot of hard work. And that's, I'm being editorial, I'm editorializing now. And uh, just glad to know you um, and just when you, because you weren't always a teacher. No, you know, when you no. started off, your career arc was, was different. You give us a little bit of a quick biography, because for me, I've always been amazed to get how you got to where you are. It's, it's great to be here with you, brother. All right? You light up the room, and you've lit up my life and hundreds and thousands of other people, and you know that. But my career arc was the best career arc decision that I made was asking you out to lunch. All right? <laughs> And I mean that, and I'll go back to that later. But outside of college, where I was at Michigan State, my degree was in political philosophy. I knew I wanted to go into government service, um, writ large, in 1987, but I didn't know where that might take me. Uh, and then I took a, a, a summer course at Buffalo State College, um, where I had a Korean professor. And he said, I said, listen, I want to go into government, but I think in teaching. And he goes, this is easy, in his beautiful, rich Korean accent. He said, who do you think trains the politicians? And he goes, don't you want to train the politicians? And of course I said yes. But before that, I had this circuitous, wonderful ride as a national park ranger in Yellowstone and Yosemite. And I was there in the major fires in 88 that were pre-climate change. Um, and then in Yosemite, my house burned. And so the Park Service probably paid me not to go to another park again. Uh, but I came back, went to grad school, and now, started Now, why did to, you, to, why, yeah. what was your interest in going into parks? It was uh, through um, a friend of mine and, and her shared interests, and I did it just because it seemed too good to pass up. You know, who doesn't want a rear ranger hat and be part of that community? But I think what the takeaway, Greg, that I had at that time as a young person was, it was pre-cell phone and pre-digital, and not that those things are bad, but at a campfire and the countless potlucks we had, we would be surrounded by people who were on the cover of National Geographic, who were accomplished and interesting in ways that you couldn't understand. Um, that, oh yeah, there's Nicole, and she's the world's experts on butterflies, and there's Allie, and she's the expert on you know water uh, on the east side of Sierra. And just as a young person, I got to be around greatness, and it was, it was a beautiful on-ramp to teaching. Um, and also because I got to take six cross-country trips uh, by car in mm -hmm. this old Toyota pickup truck that had uh, 300,000 miles on it. Um, and I slept in that truck a lot, and I was constantly listening and learning about our country. Mm -hmm. And you know, I came back here, and that got me acquainted with the Theodore Roosevelt site, where I was a docent on Delaware Avenue. So I got a grounding in local history and backed into teaching. Um, my first teaching job was because I could speak Spanish at St. Bonaventure School in West Seneca that's no longer with us. And then uh, got a job at Panama um, High School, right close by, Panama Middle School. At that point, I didn't know about Robert H. Jackson, believe it or not. Um, and while I'll come back to that later, um, I took a a teaching American history course run by Rick Walters and Paul Benson, who were part of your world here, like so many other people. And they said one of the sessions was here at the Jackson Center. Mm -hmm. And at the same point, I was now learning about, to me, the most, and so many other people, the most important event in world history, the Holocaust, and how this trumps all other history and the fact that it could be the end of civilization. And so I started taking more teacher training at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And that led to teacher fellowship programs and more teacher training and me supervising other teacher trainings. So it's a long segue from wearing a ranger hat. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, that Korean professor was right that being a teacher is a, a lever to change the world. And hopefully I played a small role in training other people that will come after you and I, that will continue that. So Panama to ultimately with Springville? To Springville. Um, we needed to get back closer to the, to the city of Buffalo for our family and friends. Mm -hmm. And um, so my day job, my passion is teaching 13-year-olds about American history. Right. 
And so that's been um, going well now for 26 years. But in the process, I realized that, you know, it's not just enough to spend a week on the Holocaust in a classroom in Springville or Panama. We need to do extensive deep dives for students and teachers, and not just to admire the problems of the past. Don't you hate that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like this, let's learn about the Holocaust, and we should. But to me, that's almost like this vulgar use of it. If you're going to go that deep in it, it better be for action. It better be for justice. And it better segue into Black Lives Matter. It better segue into environmental justice. And it better segue into making the world a better place, no matter how you slice it. Because we can't all be international prosecutors. But we can live contributory lives and be that social fabric that eroded in Nazi Germany that they just went at on so many levels. And we could have had a, a million Nuremberg trials because it wasn't just the Gurings, it was the train car drivers, it was the secretaries that processed mortgages, it was the accountants who took the leftover money from millions of people. And those are my students. So we need to teach them that the Holocaust begins with me and that my life and my career matters. And so, yeah, we're not going to be, you know, create Robert H. Jackson. So, of course, we want the Andrinas of the world to do that and the alleys of the world. But we want the kids who are driving a tractor in the town of Concord to know that their job is to stand up for others, no matter what their race, creed, or color is. Well, that, that's a really noble mission. But at some point, you as the teacher of 13-year-olds uh, mm -hmm. in Springville, uh, also collaborating with a guy named Joe Carb. <laughs> yep. And but you still got to convince the administration that mm -hmm. what you're doing, which is outside of the box, mm -hmm. is worthy, and not not rogue. How did you do that? I don't know if you know the story, but I kept wondering why my super at the time, Dr. Brenda Peters, who was still alive and living in Florida kept signing off on my teacher training to go to Washington, when secretly even my colleagues who were, who are friends, were like, oh, you're get, you got approval to, look, to go down more of this training, and mine got denied. And Brenda was a great administrator, but I asked her this question at the end, because yeah, in a, in a, in a conservative community, in any community, we were not drawing within the lines. So she went over to her cabinet and pulled out one of the pictures that is over on the right, your left, Greg. Mm -hmm. And it was her grandfather in the back row, oh, no wearing one of the white helmets. Yeah, and she said, this was, this was why. She goes, that, yeah. she, goes, I'm, she goes, yeah, I was helping you, but I was being a good granddaughter. Wow. So we had the support, but I think what we did well was show people that this wasn't out there history. It was Western New York history, right? Mm -hmm. This is the history of the most significant Western New Yorker that so many people haven't heard about. And how can we be like Robert H. Jackson and expose injustice, you know? So I gotta be careful on that, of course, you know, because my job isn't to be an activist in the classroom, it's to empower kids with the fact that they're standing on the shoulders of amazing people. And that, that's an easy job because the history speaks for itself, you know? We had the history, but then at the same time, you had to convince them that they were gonna, you were going to have this extracurricular activity in the summer, a summer institute. I forget the actual initial yeah. name for it, for, but that's sort of how we became more involved. It, yeah, it was called the initial name, which I, I cringe at now. It was called the Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies, okay. which if you look from a bad angle, it sounds like we're training kids to kill each other or kill other people, you know, but... Um, but that was came out of, the, of studying the Holocaust in, in that I realized that, you know, one week wasn't enough. So working with the Jackson Center, Holocaust Research Center of Buffalo, Irwin Bosis, mm -hmm. um, and a number of other people, we, we were able to create a five-day program that at one point was 10 days over the summer that brought kids down to the Jackson Center and introduced them to the international prosecutors so they could drink the, this beautiful Kool-Aid of of justice and inspiration. So one thing led to another. And while we really focused on genocide, because at that moment, the world was experiencing Darfur, 
It had just experienced the, 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 the hellish nature of Rwanda and Bosnia. And we realized that we couldn't just throw out platitudes. And we were throwing out platitudes. And here, Holocaust survivors barely had gray hair. And they got more gray hair from looking at these things. So we needed fresh troops. Mm -hmm. So the initial goal of the Summer Institute was to supply those fresh troops. And so they could stand on the soldiers. And, and yeah, it's, it sounds naive and everything like that. But the system worked. That was 16 years ago, Greg. Wow. And now those 13-year-olds are now 30-year-olds. And they got jobs in Washington. And they're in law schools in Boston. And they've, they realize that they're part of handing off this baton. And good teaching is ultimately getting the hell out of the way. Mm -hmm. And that was our hope. And it seems like it's happening. What was the speed bump? What was the initial speed bump uh, when you were 16 years ago creating this and creating some excitement? I mean, you have to do that. Part of the rah-rah is, is some of the things you did was come down here. We mm -hmm. had an interview with C-SPAN, you know, at one time mm -hmm. with, with all the folks. Um, but w w as you're doing that, because you're the mm -hmm. you're the evangelist, sure. you're out, you're the the the, the leader of that. Uh, what was the speed bump? Did somebody say uh, this isn't going to last? This is it's going to it's just a flash in the pan. It was. Did you reach any of that sort of? I think the speed bump right away was that I didn't want it to be a one hit wonder. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked and not, you know, current favor with you. I loved the fact that what you did was a house that couldn't be blown over. Um, that the Holocaust Resource Center was here for 30 years. And I wanted to, you know, create a structure that had some bones because I saw that, you know, a lot of nonprofits die within the first couple of years. And not that we're out of the woods by no means, but the, the beautiful part about the Jackson Center is that it's gonna live you know, beyond all of us. And that's a credit to you and you building these deep roots. So initially I wanted to make sure that it had strong roofing and a great foundation and working with a lot of other people that, that did it. But meanwhile, it was our work in Rwanda that was going on too. Mm -hmm. and, and we thought both of these things would be one-shot wonders. That, okay, we'd have a conference in Rwanda where we had some contacts, we visited there, and on a mass grave of 200,000, I asked one of the um, new, it was a newly opened Kigali Genocide Memorial Museum. And I remember going in there, it was roughly 2006, 2007, and I said, do you do any teacher training? And she said, no. Um, and then I went back to the Holocaust Museum where I was on a fellow, one funding stream led to another, and we were able to train Rwanda teachers about the Holocaust. Hmm. Now that seems sort of like an arcane apple and orange type situation. But in Rwanda 90, in, 90, in 2006, that was only 12 years after the genocide. So this would be the equivalent of teaching about uh, civil rights in, in 1877 in Greensboro, you know, Kentucky, or Greensboro, South Carolina. So, but, so Rwanda teachers couldn't talk about 94 because the kids of survivors and the kids of perpetrators were in the classroom. But they could talk about 1944. Mm -hmm. And, and for the first time in their lives, a lot of them said, oh, we thought we were cursed. We're all cursed by this, this devil of the fact that we could kill each other. Um, but it was that, that time where, to answer your question, again, I, I, was, I was seeing that organizations could come and go. And ultimately, everything comes and goes. But I wanted whoever trains the most teachers first wins. And the bad guys of the world know that. The bad guys of the world know that who shoot Malala and start Boko Haram. They know that teachers are crucial. Um, and well, Jackson, you know, I'll, I'll end this question in a long-winded way. When he came back, and you know this better than anybody, after Nuremberg to the UB Law School, and he quoted H.G. Wells saying, the world is in a race between education and catastrophe. So he didn't work with any teachers, but that quote sure did to me, you know. In a world of which uh, civil rights and therefore uh, international criminal law is the prosecution, the, the judicial arm of that all, and there's so much of it going on in the country, 
How does your organization focus so that you don't get too dispersed, you know, when somebody says, gee, we should look at this, we should look at that. Yeah. We should, cause it's, all it's always hard, right? So, yeah. It's yeah. social justice. Yeah. Social justice is, is evolving, and that's it's evolved since we started, yeah. and especially in an age after George Floyd. You know, and it's, um, you know I'm very much dated as a, a white male in my mid-50s. I, I need to really do a good job in getting out of my way. Yeah, in the organization's way. But you're right. And the, the way we, we square that circle, Greg, is the emphasis isn't on this issue or that issue. It's on living a contributory life. Hmm. Now, the history of the Holocaust inspires all of us at its best that we can all make a difference. And if we don't, that vacuum is going to be filled by the bad guys of the world. So the way the, the Academy for Human Rights works now is that we try to take your talents and infuse them with confidence and inspiration and the power of history. So if you want to be an engineer, um, okay, how can you do that through the lens of human rights to live a contributory life? And the beat about that, it's not Republican or Democrat, all right? You know, the, the firemen, the volunteer firemen in the, you know, in Casadega, he's living a contributory life. And we all need to do that in some way for civilization to continue. So that's our modus operandi. Um, and it's a beautiful phrase, and it's you know it it it, it avoids all those landmines about overreach, and because it's certainly we can't address every issue. Um, we try to do it by theme for what it's worth, but um, you know we try to focus on the power of the individual. Early on to get recognition, I know one of the things you uh, and we did the same thing here at the Jackson Center. Mm -hmm was to be able to touch the hem of individuals who were in the field. No. I hate to use the term celebrities, but... They were, though, yeah. They were. Well, you're one, too. They were. Yeah. And uh, uh, we were thrilled to have access to some of your yeah. contacts and you, your ours. Uh, is that important now, or is have you done this long enough so that the message, the purpose, supersedes any kind of wow factor to have somebody who's associated with you having done much? I, th I think initially, you know, we were, the, the academy was, was drafting off of the Jackson Center and the HRC. And I knew that, that, and we're still a growing nonprofit, okay? We're not the Jackson Center, we're not the Holocaust Museum. But that's the way things are growing. Um, so, so right now, I think one of our most successful collaborations have been in this room, and some of our longest lasting um, nutritional I educational items from our surveys have been with our kids saying, oh yeah, I sat next to Greg Peterson and Jim, uh, and Jim Johnson and Dave Crane and Brenda Hollis, and I could be these people. You know, that, that's the benefit of coming down here, right? Um, is, and especially the benefit of the law dialogues is that, Okay, they, they walk on two legs and they have kids and they want to show me their selfies. You know, okay, cool, I can do that. So I think, yeah, we're, we're now a fledgling, more than a fledgling organization, but our roots will always be, always be here in Jamestown. No, no, no question. But the long term, though, what we want to do is it's called the Academy for Human Rights, not Buffalo, because in three years we're going to start bringing teacher fellows from around the world by Zoom and in person so then they can steal the sauce of teacher training and take that and start an academy for human rights in Pittsburgh or Kigali or, you know, in, in Glasgow. Um, and that, that's my, you know, next chapter, hopefully. Do you have time to reflect on 16 years? <laughs> in the same amount of time that I think um, you might have to reflect on the past 16 years here, you know, and I don't mean that flippantly, you know? No, I don't. Um, and it's something that um, my friends have told me I should be doing. Um, but I recently had a life-altering medical event that um, has forced me to do that a little bit. Um, I need to steal more pages out of your playbook and make sure that what I've done is going to be continued through others who are younger than me. Um, and um, no, there's no time to look back and, you know, they, they, I can look back and what mistakes I've made. That's, that's what I need to do, not to look back at what we've done right. 
that's it. That's easy. Can you name one mistake? Um, yeah, I think there were some procedural things that um, working with others, you learn how to manage them and how to keep them involved and not to hurt their feelings because we're all human beings and you want to make sure that people are honored and recognized and the more you do this, the more you realize that, okay, I should be honoring somebody or so for so-and-so and, you know, just to keep, you know, to do the right thing, which is legitimate. So I made, you know, several mistakes just as a beginning manager of not um, making sure um, that I, I, I recognize the power of, of recognizing other people. And I tried to do that the best I could, but invariably, you know, some things fell between the cracks that I regret. At some point, I'll interview your colleague, Joe Carb, and I will mm -hmm. ask the same question I'm going to ask you now. What's Joe Carb, it's called a collaboration, but Joe Carb meant Joe to you? Carb, Joe Carb and I, we were hired at, at almost the same time at Springville. He's always the brightest guy in the room. He's a gifted teacher, but he's gifted at, at being creative. And it was his idea to take the fellowship model of the Holocaust Museum and bring it here to the Jackson Center. Hmm. It, was, it was his idea constantly to keep reaching out to teachers for Jackson. Um, in many ways, we were the perfect Lennon and McCartney because he was, now he could do what I can, but he was primarily back of the house and I was mainly the front of the house. And, you know, but again, I, um, I hopefully I've contributed to his career as much as he's given me because he's always, like, he has this gentle way of, of problem solving and envisioning things. Um, and I don't know about how you do that because you're a big picture guy, but you can also do the little, the, the things, the budget things and the answering the emails and following up. Joe's got a way better attention span than I have, Greg. <laughs> And, you know, that's been, I, I, you know, I, my career wouldn't have been anything without him. Plus, he never ages. He, his hair gets darker. My gosh. Yeah. He looks 15 yeah. still. He, is, he looks 15. I know. I know. <laughs> but um, Joe, when you watch this, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But, um, but I'd be interested, you know, I, I think he will always defer, you know, in his answers. Um, but that business card that you happen would, you know, because uh, it was constant advice and consent with me. So yeah, talk about the business card, the National Teachers Hall of Fame. At some point you get a call from somebody that says, I'm a representative of the National Hall of Fame for teachers and you have been selected. What was your reaction? My reaction was to call my fifth grade teacher, mm -hmm. Mrs. Brompton, and let her know that, um, let her know that she could be proud of me. And she already was. And then uh, I saw her last August, the night before she died, and gave her a kiss on the, on the forehead. Mm. She was in a coma. You know, she didn't know. But it was um, a representative on the Hall of Fame committee uh, named Norm Kennard, who his group called Life in the Jar sort of rediscovered the life of a Holocaust rescuer named Irene Assembly. And you know, due to what I led here in Buffalo, um, exposing the genocide in Darfur and how students can be involved in that equation, um, Norm knew about me. Um, he nominated me for the Irina Sendler Award. Uh, we went to Poland and saw Mrs. Sendler before she died. I have a great anecdote about that. Um, and then he's the one who said, listen, you should, you should apply and to the Hall of Fame in Kansas which has been around 30 years. There's 150 teachers in from all sorts of subjects. Um, and initially I said, listen, I've got, I'm not, I've got to recognize a lot of people here in Buffalo. I'll often get credit, like I think you might, for, for accomplishments that other people have done. And so we needed to recognize, the, I needed to help recognize those people here first. And then I forgot about the Hall of Fame and they reapproached me again. And then I'm like, okay, don't be, don't be dumb here. <laughs> this is important um, because it's gonna, the Hall of Fame's nice. I get recognition every day from 13 year olds. That's, that's my Hall of Fame, is when a kid says, Mr. Biter, and I went to school yesterday after being out a while, and I got hugs. That's, that's why, you, why you wake up, right? But the Hall of Fame, um, ultimately, my applying there gave me a bigger megaphone. Yeah. And, and, I, and I need that for training teachers and moments like this, you know? So that's why that means something to me, and they're a magnificent organization. 
there in Emporia, Kansas, which is one of where it's one of the nation's first teacher colleges was. And, you know, the people there, the, my class and the class that came after us are just really inspirational people that are ordinary people who do great things. Um, and hopefully I can keep up with them. You uh, left us hanging on my peanut gallery here to my left mm -hmm. about the anecdote in Poland that you showed. <laughs> Something. You, you should, yeah, it was you great. Tell that. It was great. All right, so Irina Sandler was a Polish Catholic social worker, right? I don't know if you got a visual on her. Okay. I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, in World War II, she was a social worker, so the Nazis let her go in inside the Warsaw Ghetto, not to, like, rescue Jews, but to make sure that typhus didn't escape to the precious Nazi soldiers. So she could go in and out. She had a magic pass, so she was able to smuggle young Jews out and have these heroic conversations with their parents, many of whom died. And she saved as many people as Schindler, and she would say with her network called Jugoda. So the Sandler Ward gives me ten thousand dollars. They say you can spend this anything you want, but we're seeing Irina. So we bring my wife and I bring our kids, and it was this beautiful moment. And it was almost the the moment in Seinfeld where you, where George and Jerry were in front of the soup Nazi, and you got one request and you can't blow it. They said she's sharp, now schmoozing, say hello. And that's it. And there were some high-profile rabbis in front of me. This is a big deal, right? So my daughter goes before me. She's in this beautiful dress. And she shook Irina's hand as a five-year-old. And you could tell Irina was just loving it because, you know, she had so many kids' hands. And then I came up very quickly. Ms. Semler, thanks for being here. Thanks for what you've done. And then she, immediately before I started, ended the sentence, she started giggling. And like, here's a hundred year old Polish woman giggling, the translator's giggling. And I'm like, you know, what the heck did I say? Did I somehow, you know, offend her? Did somehow the translation come out wrong? Did I have my fly open? And here's the most, the most beautiful moment of my life, bar none, all right? I mean, just imagine meeting Schindler or, you know, here's this, you know, you get it. And so I went out in the hallway in this nursing home in Warsaw and I wasn't crying, but I was close. And, you know, and my, and my wife came out, she's like, what's wrong? I think I just blew it. I don't know what, what the heck went wrong here. And so later on, we befriended the, 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 the translator named Kinga, who was, you know, this young, amazingly talented Polish woman. And over a drink, I'm like, Kinga, you got to tell me, like, I screwed up back there. And, her, and then she goes, she goes, when? And then she goes, oh, she goes, no, 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 no. And this rich Polish accent, she goes, she goes through, she goes, Mrs. Sandler, she goes, I... Ms. Sinner said, she goes, oh, it's very nice of the American government to send me such an attractive man. <laughs> and then, going back to Joe Carb, you know, I said, Joe, this is good news. Mrs. Sandler thought I was attractive. And he goes, oh, yeah, it's the story of your life. A hundred-year-old Polish woman thinks you're hot. He goes, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, she died um, two weeks later. Yeah. And so my daughter's hand was the last yeah. kid's hand that she wow. touched, which was awesome. Great story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so you knew you might be inter interviewed here on, as you were coming down today. You just kind of knew that there might have a chance. To, I knew you, that. Any, you were trying to screw. I knew it. that any time you could put a microphone in somebody, you, you do. Yeah, yeah. And you got a great crew here that, yeah, yeah. that makes it happen. So, as you're thinking about this, that might happen. What is the question that you thought might occur that hasn't yet? About um, you. No, about uh, the time that Joe and I spent here. Yeah. as education directors. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to us, was super rewarding mm -hmm. because work, you working with you know, some amazing donors here saw the vision that's still here that this center is, is almost nothing unless it's in the hands of 13-year-olds. And so that, to me, was... And again, that's where Joe moved the ball forward. You know, he maybe gave me the microphone, but Joe's the one who made sure we were reaching out. We had five fellows a year. One of them had to be from Jamestown. Um, and now the fellows are coming in from around the country by Zoom. So that to me was, um, you know, hopefully that'll continue and get more robust, you know, but that was a special moment in our lives to come down here and be part of your world and more importantly, you know, inspire other people to be uh, to be like Robert Jackson, you know, 
Well, I just uh, from a personal side, yeah. I mean, I just hold you and Joe in the highest yeah. esteem yeah. for what you've accomplished. That, that kind of almost goes without saying. But uh, I also, you invited me to enter your world. Uh, yeah. At your teachers' conferences, the yes. national teachers' conferences, we'd go. That's right. And yeah. there was yeah. awards. Yeah. That was yeah. a Robert H. Jackson for yeah. a few years. Yeah. And to meet some of the folks and, uh, uh, and also, likewise, interview people who uh, had access to, uh, who just happened to be book people, you know, which then, mm -hmm. in turn, who were civil rights people who might have been uh, part mm -hmm. of the Little Rock Nine and all of a sudden ended up here. I mean, there was a whole world we, I jumped into, and I it was thrilled that you invited me to be part of that, and that was fun. That was, that was a hoot and a very expansive for me. I, I'd like to think in my better moments, um, the the younger brother that I don't know if you have, you know, um, and that you know you're you you're always the guy who lights up the room and remembers names and you know the fact that I could do this stuff with you and we could have fun together and collaborate and forget about how you know it started you know um, but you had faith like and I, I I'd rather like what what did you see when I said I need your logo. Like you, you saw, you saw a vision and the power of training kids, and I think you saw more than I did. You did, you know, and that was that to me was the fact that I will, I will, you know, run through a wall for you for that, and I think you know I'm one of hundreds of people to say that, you know. I'm honored by all of that, and uh, I must. It's just funny how things build upon things, and 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 I know you know this as well as anybody. But one step often leads to another. You know, my stumbling mm -hmm. on to Rick Walters, my stumbling yeah. on who hired me at Panama, Paul Benson, yeah, and who's now a board member and a good friend, having dinner with them Saturday. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and to have them as we were just yeah. thinking along, and all of a sudden they had this history grant, and Paul thinking it would be great to enhance his history grant application if he had yeah. the name of the Jackson Center. And I didn't know Paul from Adam. Sure. I didn't know Rick from Adam. But they, in turn, brought me in. I brought them in. We learned a little bit together. Next thing you know, they'd say, no, we got this young, wonderful student or teacher. You know, we got to reel him in. You know, you don't know him, but his name is Drew Bider. And there was also a, a guy who was uh, sort of their, your early computer guy. Uh, I want to say Swanson, but... Uh, but yeah, there, there was, Swanson was there. Swanson was a student of mine uh, from Panama. But it's let, But that's the type of thing. You don't know where one door leads to another. Absolutely. But the Holocaust of today, all right? And granted, I don't mean this in any disregard to, you know, preventing genocide and international war crimes and the things that are in the DNA of this, of this building. Um, but the, 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 the injustices of the present, of the future, are going to be grounded in the warming of the planet. And so I've pivoted in the past two years from my primary research opportunities is with Holocaust education and training teachers to training teachers about climate and sustainability. Because if the predictions are true on this and we start to see them happening, the, the, the killer storm from the warped you know, uh, polar vortex that hit our community last month, it, this is gonna be the new normal and it's gonna lead to massive refugee flows and it's gonna lead to um, ultimately societies decaying and strong and coming in and we, we got to be prepared for it and right now science, global climate change is only being taught in in science classrooms for the most part it's not being taught in history where there's solutions history classes where the solutions in English classes where there's problem solving and math classes so for the rest of my professional career I really want to push the power of teaching about climate change to non-science teachers which sounds arcane all right but that just, you could argue that genocide prevention is history of the world, but damn, Greg, if we don't train teachers about climate, and I'm talking, if I was Secretary of Education right now, there would be mobile training units of master teachers. You know those Rolling Stone t-shirts that you had as a kid that said Rolling Stones, you know, 9-4, Albuquerque, then Santa Fe, then Vegas? We should be having mobile, mobile squads of master teachers of all disciplines hitting every city in our country right now. Um, because we're, we are so far behind, and that's what keeps me up at night. You know, Holocaust education is in good hands in the world. Um, I played a role maybe connecting the dots to contemporary genocide, but I hope now we can do the same and have a, a massive effect training to teach about climate. I don't and that's one one door leading to another. And that's, I don't think you'll ever retire. That's the nice thing. No, uh, hopefully not. Hopefully, exactly. hopefully, um, 
I'll be able to recover um, physically uh, from what happened a couple months ago and, um, you know, live a long life. Well, I'm rooting for you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, for, thank you for letting me do this. No, thank you. It's, it, um, we thank you for being part of your world and for you being generous in your spirit and in your connections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.